despite her youthful appearance, <laughs> is an old woman. It's actually an old woman. Thank you very much. With many years. No, seriously, she has very, very many years experience in advertising, in branding, in marketing. Um, starting from McCann Erickson, which is one of the biggest um, integrated marketing companies in the world. Um, in New York, where she must have been one of the youngest vice presidents. And since she's come back to Nigeria, she's worked with a number of um, major integrated marketing companies and has and now currently runs Yellow Brick Road, which is, I don't want to use the word integrated marketing company <laughs> again, but I may have to use that. And also Black Box, which is a branding company. So essentially she is, she knows what she's talking about. She's also my little cousin. Not, not a little bit. Well, not a little bit. <laughs> my cousin. Real cousin, not that big. <laughs> Real cousin, cousin. Uh, so, um, so she's here to talk about pitching and winning new business. Good morning. Um, I have a tendency to talk quickly. So if, you, if I start rushing, just throw something at me. I'll slow down. So I'm here really to talk about winning new business. Because um, I don't really enjoy pitching. Pitching is a waste of time and a waste of money. Um, it's just like I say, I don't shop, I buy. Right? Um, so the first thing about new business is getting in the door. Right? Um, especially if you're on your own or in a smaller company, you can't wait until the client can start out to pitch. So how do you get people to even get on their radar? The first thing is the elevator pitch. And it was actually interesting when I walked in and all of you were talking about what you did. You generally have 60 seconds when you meet someone, whether you meet them outside at a hotel, you meet them at an event, you meet them at a networking dinner. You have a minute to tell them why they should listen to you and what it is you have to offer. There's a tendency to ramble. It's very important to actually practice your elevator pitch. It sounds crazy, but you have to practice it because you never know where or when you're going to meet this person and you have to be ready to go at any moment. My elevator pitch generally goes something like this. If I were doing an elevator pitch to come and speak here, I started my, my career in business development. Over the last 15 years, I've probably done about 1,000 pitches and I have about a 60% close rate. I'd really, really like to come and talk to you and share, and share some of what I've learned. That's my pitch. And that's how you get somewhere, right? And those things also happen to be true. But it's very, very important that when you first meet someone, you're already thinking not just about what you can do, but what it is that they want to hear. You may do a billion things. What is it that this person is going to be like, you know, actually, here's my card. Call me. And then when you call them, they will actually answer the phone. Or when you send them the email, they will actually respond. And the other thing is, I get a lot of, I get a lot of emails, people email email us from the website, I get a lot of tweets. Not that your stuff is garbage, but I think it's a great idea. What they, what these people did is they literally <coughs> took authentic New York trash, picked up from the streets of Manhattan, and put it in this really beautiful perspex box, and they're selling it. <laughs> and people are buying it. <laughs> <laughs> Packaging is all. Presentation is everything. And it's always matters. If I get something and things are spelt wrong, if you say you're a copywriter and things are spelt wrong and there are grammatical errors, I'm not calling you back. If you're a designer and things are lopsided and uneven and the colors don't match, you send me a presentation with like 50 different fonts, I'm not calling you back. If when I meet you, my whole thing is you can meet people anywhere, but it's not always appropriate to approach me. If I meet you and you're kind of drunk and you're kind of crazy, I'm not going to call you back. Presentation is everything. And you have in that one minute an opportunity. And if you lose that opportunity, it's very hard to get it back. Unfortunately, I don't have enough of these cards, so I'm just going to pass these around. One of the companies, and you guys can just pass them back and forth. One of the companies that I, that I own, my partner and I started, is called Blackbox. And Blackbox is a strategic marketing consultancy. Nobody knows what that means. Um, and so I would meet people and you know, meet people all the time, oh, you know, I'm you know, a strategist, and I do my spiel, and then the next day I call them another career. Oh. <laughs> so we had these cards made. And the card says, hi, my name is Nando Yoshi, and I'm a strategist. 
I'm in the business of ideas, ideas that work in the real world. If you want to talk to me about how I can help your company, find the best way to get from where you are to where you want to be, call me at blah, blah, blah. People love this card. I bought more business off this card than my, my entire resume. Because what it shows them is that I have an understanding of what it is that I do. I solve a communication problem for myself. I can do this with this, imagine what I can do with your company. Presentation is everything. And in all of the things that I'm going to talk about, keep that in mind. If you are sending a proposal, if you are sending an email, if you're sending a letter, presentation matters. It matters the kind of paper that you see. Because the truth about it is, people will judge you on how you present yourself. You get up in the morning, you get dressed, you look great, and you hand me a piece of paper and it's like torn and has stains on it. Presentation matters. Relevance. The thing about it is, okay, so how many, how many of you are like creative creatives, like you, you, you writers or designers or, how many of you have a portfolio that's ready to go? How many of you only have one portfolio? If you come to me and I'm like, you know, actually I have it for Coca-Cola. It's not relevant to me. It's great to have, I would say if, the, if you are a creative person, you should have an online portfolio. Somewhere I can go, you don't have to send me like a massive document that's going to clog up my mailbox. Somewhere I can go and see everything. But when you get my card and you send me something, you say, here is some of the more relevant that I've, work that I've done recently. Please go here to see the rest of it. I don't have time to sit through five years of your work. It might be fantastic, but I have a job. But if you met me and we were talking about first night, send me stuff that you think is relevant to that. It's all about here. Because if you're not talking about something that I'm interested in, I'm going to post. Okay? Um, manage your online reputation, especially for the younger people in the room. Um, because one of the first things that I will do, if I meet you and I like the work, is that I'm going to Google you. And I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Twitter, and, and, you know, and I Google myself periodically, just to make sure that what shows up. Because the truth is that this poor boy lost his job at the Red Cross, right? It's very, very important. The internet is the first place a prospective customer is going to go to look for information for you. This is not to say that you shouldn't have a private and fun life online. What you might want to do is separate them. Also, please, 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 on your private accounts, watch your privacy settings. They're there for a reason. I do not want to see the picture of you in how about that one weekend where you had to get right? Because I will never be able to get that picture out of my mind. The, your online reputation is really important. It's also important to build a positive reputation. Are you publishing? Do you have a blog? Are you contributing to industry sites? The more you can get your work and yourself out there, the more that there's not just your portfolio, but I can also see that you're part of a larger community and you're doing stuff. So it's really, really important more and more to be able to create a sense of, even if you're small, can create a sense of scope just by the fact that I'm seeing this person blogging, I'm seeing this person's work on, on lots of different sites. So really be out there and market yourself in that way is free. So, you met me, you gave me my card, you called me, I sort of remember who you are. I've gone, I've seen your portfolio, I'm like, you know what, actually, there's this job that I have to do. And we are a little bit, <coughs> a little stuck at the agency. Let me, let me, let me call this person and we see what they can do. The first thing, when I started working, 1997, my first job in advertising, my first job in advertising, um, and I worked for um, a really smart lady called Marty Altshaw, um, and I worked in business development. I was a business development coordinator, um, and basically my job was to manage the pitch process for the McCann New York office and for the McCann Global Network. Um, and for my first year, I worked on 60 minutes. And um, my job was to do the initial background. Um, and what she always said to me is, don't start with the brand. Start with the people. And the first briefing I always gave was on management. Who is the MD or CEO? Who is the marketing director? And who is in charge of this brand? What is their history? Where are they coming from? And what, if anything, do I know about their predilections? Right? It's really, really, really important to understand your audience because 
along with all creative people, and I would say to my, my creatives, if you want to win awards, go make private, go make, you know, small budget films and, and enter them in, in film festivals. Advertising is, and, and marketing is the job of selling. If you're working for a client, you have to understand what they're going to buy. Um, this is not to say that you shouldn't be creative, but it is to understand that if I am a really conservative Christian, naked ladies are not going to pass. And if you really believe that naked ladies are the only way to make a point, then you have to understand that when you're selling me the naked ladies, you have to tell me why. Understand your audience. Understand who it is you're selling to because that client is your first customer. Do your research. Do your research about the brand. Do your research about the person, about the company, about how they do business. And it's really, really important to understand and talk to people. Talk to people who've done work with them before. Talk to people who haven't done work with them before. Get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Understand what your situation is. Because every every company, every every company has its own culture. And there's some that are really collaborative and they want you to talk to you. There's some that literally do not want to see you until the work is done. And they just hand on the work and they never want to see you again. <laughs> understand, no, it's true. Okay. Do your research, understand how all of it works so that you understand what your role is. Do good work. This seems like a really simple thing, but it actually harks back to something that Trudy was talking about. I don't talk about doing creative work. Creative work is a given, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. Do good work, and that is work that actually accomplishes the goal that was set. Does it actually work? Is it going to make them money, or get them customers, or elevate their brand, whatever it is that you do? Because at the end of the day, all of the other things that I'm going to talk about are important. But as creatives, this is how we should be judged. It's great to have great relationships. It's great to have great cash flow. If you don't do good work, then get in the water. And so it's not just about being creative for the sake of creative. Understand what that client needs. Does that client need new customers? Does that client need different customers? Does that client need to impress their boss? What does that client need? And can you do the work that will get them there? That is how you get repeat business. I always say that our goal in our agency is never to pitch. Literally, my actual business objective is for 100% of our work to come by a referral. It's not about pitching, it's about winning. We get, probably on now, about 40% of our work on a farm. Ask someone who works with us, who does good work? Who did that work for you? What's an agency that you recommend? What's a designer that you recommend? That's how you want to build your business, how you want to build your reputation. This is how you do it. Good work also comes on time. Good work also comes on time. The biggest issue when I work with freelancers is this thing of time. It's what Trudy was talking about, it's about the creatives aren't disciplined. It's nonsense. My father was a painter. He was one of the most disciplined people I knew, at least in his work. He spent a certain amount of hours every day painting, working on his technique. That's how you get good. It's 10,000 hours. If you haven't read the Malcolm Gladwell book, go buy it. Writers, to write a book of 400 pages, you have to sit down and write. And write every day and then rewrite. It takes discipline to produce good work. It's on time. It's on spec. I shouldn't have to call you and say, oh, you didn't, you, you sent me the JPEGs, but you didn't send the call drop box. I shouldn't have to call you and be like, oh, where's the font? Presentation is also everything. When you finish, when you finish the job, give me everything. Show me that you've thought through it. And if I haven't asked for something, ask me if I need it. That's part of your job. Now, you know, the next time they say we need someone, those call that that was that guy that did that work for us. We had a really, really good and got it on time. Great. And we have literally there are people that call and there's the call again never work for us again. We have that list in the office. And if, and if I have that list and sometimes I'll be oh we need this thing and I'm like I don't care. I'd rather call my clients and tell them we'll be late. This is about presentation. Um, one of the things that I have spent a lot of my life doing is standing up in front of a group of people and talking to them about ideas that we've worked on. 
Um, and what I've learned is that there's an art to presenting. Um, you have to build your story. Because the truth of it is that no one is sitting around waiting for the next great ad, the next great radio script, or the next great sponsorship idea. They've been thinking about the fight that they had with their wife, and the fact that their MD is calling them and had their foot up. They have all sorts of things in there. So when they walk into that room for the presentation, you are not their focus. You have to get them there. You set the stage for them. You have to explain to them what's happening in the world. You know, and, and different you know, and different different kinds of businesses need different kinds of story. But the thing is, you want to get this motion going before you show them your work. Because you have to put them in the mindset of you're creating this work for these people for these reasons. So then they're not thinking about their wife or their pastor or their child or their secretary who hasn't ordered lunch. They're thinking about, okay, this is the thing that I'm trying to do and these are the people that I'm talking to and these are the kinds of things that they're interested in. So when they should, when they see the work that you know, I get it. No one is when they walk into a presentation, is in a mood to they'll be like impress me, and they're looking to be critical. That's I mean, and I'll be honest, I do it too. You're looking to be critical. What you have to do is put me in a receptive frame of mind. Build a story. Build your story. Tell your story. Explain how you got where you are. So when I see the work, I'm like, all right. I may not like it. But I understand it. And that's the other thing. Um, and I'm a creative, I'm a writer, so I understand that you spend this time and this energy and you build this thing and you put it forward and the person goes, eh. It's not exciting. <laughs> Can't you make it jazzier? So I had a client. There's no va 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 boom. I was like, oh, va 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 boom, you and you. Um, and I had to learn, and it took me a long time to learn not to be immediately defensive. Look, there are some clients that are stupid. Right, let's just be honest. But most of them aren't. And the truth of it is, your client is probably representative of the person who's going to see that work at the end. You are not your customer. Learn to take direction. And honestly, the best thing to say is, I heard you. Let us go back and see if we can see this. Do not get into a fight at the presentation. You won't win. And then you'll just be that person that isn't that isn't flexible. And this is not to say that you give in and just do what the client wants. But at the end of the day, it's like it's not exciting. What is it? What is it that it's not achieving? This is not to say that when they say make the logo bigger, you go and make the logo bigger. But okay, is it that you're not understanding immediately who this is from? Okay, that's a design challenge. Then you go and solve that. And come back and build. And when you build your story, tell them the last time we were here, you were feeling like it wasn't immediately apparent who the brand was. This is how we solved it. Build it into your story. Show them that you've taken their, their feedback. Help them remember you. When I started, like I said, I worked in, in business development. And um, my boss at the time was a big believer in what she called the tchotchke. And the tchotchke was a little bit of a gimmick that we would do at every pitch. Follow up. Send an email. Make a phone call. Send a text. The number of freelancers that I work with you do something, you pay them seven hundred fifty thousand naira, and then you don't hear from them again. I'm not gonna call you. It's not all the money in the world, but I know that I probably at least bought your petrol. Call me and say thank you. The ones I remember, the ones that they get one after they've done the job, they call me, they thank me for the opportunity. When they get their check, they call me and they thank me. Then I call again. They're always at the front of my list. Follow up. It's also important because sometimes you pitch and then you don't hear anything. It's because they've, the, 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 the business has moved on. I do a lot of work with First Bank, and it's like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Silence. And when we first started working with them, we were like, okay, well, you know. And then six months later, they're like, well, whatever happened to that thing? I'm like, well, you guys stopped doing it. The business had moved on, but that project is still there. If you haven't heard in a week, send an email. Never heard in two weeks, make a phone call. Follow up. It is nobody's job to get you money but you. Right? Your job is to win that pitch. And if they don't give it to you, call them up and ask them why. Not in a belligerent, I'm a fantastic person, why the hell did you give me the job? But we want to be better, I want to be better. Can you help me understand what could I have done to win this business? 
whether you get it or not, follow up. Sometimes you don't uh, if you sales stuff as in you marketed your sales to mm -hmm. the black client and all of that stuff and all of a sudden you just realize that the person is not really showing interest, not showing enthusiasm to do that job anymore. Just like the one the instance you mentioned about first bar, you know. And what do you do in such situation as in it's obvious, it's glaring that they are not willing to do it anymore. You wait a minute. The next day, you send an email and say thank you. If you haven't heard, you send another email. And then you literally, and I, I promise you, people actually will appreciate it. If you, were, you send them an email and you say, you know, it's been a couple of weeks. I just want to know if this project has been put on the back burner. And if so, is it okay for me to give you a call in a couple of months, maybe by that time come back? So acknowledge it, but don't be like, all right, yeah, forget you people we're not doing. But say, okay, obviously, it seems like, it seems that, you know, like the business, this, this project might be on hold. Let me get, you know, can I come back to you? In, and then in eight weeks or three weeks or whatever, engage again. It's all about follow-up. Um, I've had two clients particularly that had followed up for like three months and there's no response. And another project came in. I had to be on the other project. I did not call right in the other project. One of them called. And I had to give them my own time that I'm on something right now. That when I'm through, I'll come back. and. They, they got angry. That wants to work on a project right now. Now, how do one manage that? For an enterprise that doesn't have a system yet, that uh, an HR system that you have to send someone that's going to work for you and all that. So, should we talk about partners? Um, it's very, very important to have a network. Because the truth is that, and I, I know because I'm, I'm a client and I'm also on the agency side. Clients are unreasonable, and the reason that clients are unreasonable is because. That person who has is yelling at you, some has somebody has their foot firmly on their neck, right? And while all they're doing is they're pushing that pressure down. Um, if someone has had, and I work with multi-million dollar companies, and it happens, and then one day the MD's wife wakes up and says, why didn't we do that thing? The MD comes in and says, why didn't we do that thing? And then there's panic. Um, and then they call you. Um, and I appreciate that you can't, and you have to I can't just drop everything to you. So that you have two options. One is to say, I can make a referral. If you need this done right now, and it depends on your relationship with the client, right? If it's a client that you've done work with before, you can be honest with them and say, I can't do this thing right now. I have to put, like, what I do is I can find this guy, he's great. And I will make sure he takes care of me. If it's a client that you don't know as well, if you have a partner that you can trust, you can farm that work out and share the revenue. Because what you want to do is you want to be responsive. But especially when it's at the beginning of the relationship with a client, you just want them to know that you're responsive to them. So what the, at the end of the day, it's like I tell my clients, nobody cares about your back office. They don't want to come and sit there with you while you're doing whatever you're doing. They just want to get it done and, done and get it done well. And so that's why it's important also to have a network of people that you can call on. Like, hey, I'm in a jam. I need to get this thing done. Keep your eye on it. And make sure that's delivered and that client will always really be capable of doing that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, let me use my own case as a study. I write brands and marketing. Mm -hmm. I have a page, uh, but three pages of the in national market. So can you speak up? Okay. I discovered that okay, I relate with most of the PR agencies. Mm -hmm. And most of them, I think I find out that the only reason why they get the business because they have been able to present a good pitch to get the business. But unfortunately, in delivering the materials to the press, I am one of the channel, I can I consider myself as one of the value chain. I consider myself as the middle, as the, the channel between the client and the final consumer of the um, the communication or solution. But most of the time when the PR agencies send their materials and it's kind of that's badly written. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how that clients, how can clients approve this kind of a press release mm -hmm. or feature story that is not, that cannot even be published because it can either be classified as an advertorial mm -hmm. that should be paid for. Mm -hmm. So I'm outside of it now. These people, most of these PR agencies, writing 
in materials is a big problem for them. They do not have to write those things well, professionally. And I said, yeah, I can pitch into this area. In that circumstance, how can I pitch for a business if I'm starting my own? Okay. So I think that if, you, if, what you're, if what you're interested in doing is becoming a resource for PR agents, become a writing resource, then the first thing that you need is you need um, a book, you need a portfolio, right? You need a portfolio. You need a collection of maybe five or six stories that you've written that you think represent you well, and a CBD, TV. You need an electronic copy, and you need a really nicely bound hard copy. Then you need to either through the agencies, the connections that you have personally, or you make a list of, of, of PR agencies that you want to work for, and you and it's cold call. But you do, you go, you send, you know, you get an email, you send the email, you follow up with a hard copy, and then you say, you know, can I call you and talk to you about it? You don't say to them, because your writing is crap, <laughs> I think that you should hire me. You say that you have this much experience, um, that you understand, you know, obviously that some agents sometimes they have, you know, they might have an overflow of work. I mean, you have to be, you, know, you have to be diplomatic about it. But you do what you do is you present yourself as an additional resource. You don't want to, and you tell them that you have no interest in dealing directly with clients, that you really just want to be a resource to the agents. That's how you do it. Well, uh, I work in the fields of web and uh, brand identity. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to find out what your experience is with clients, uh, I mean during the pitch process, mm -hmm. clients wanting you to like do half of the work you know, during the pitch process, like mm -hmm. demos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I have a policy of not doing demos, you know, and obviously it's cost me a lot of work, but um, I mean it's my policy, so I'd, I'd like to find what your experience is with that. Um, so, one of, one of my favorite, you know, one of my favorite pitch stories, like we get to this pitch for, well, I can say FinBank because they don't exist anymore, we get this pitch for FinBank. Um, and we walk into like it's like this conference room. It's like literally there's like 30 people in this conference room, um, and like there's this one dude in the back, and he's like fast asleep. And I'm like, oh, like <laughs> snoring asleep. So I'm presenting, and he's asleep. And I'm like, I do you know, do I like stop? Because he's a senior person. So then after we do the presentation, we present our 56 million executions, and we have spoken all the English I'm going to speak, and dude wakes up, <laughs> like, and says to me. So where is the TVC? <laughs> no, no. You know, he's like, where is the advert? Like, <laughs> so you know, like, my mother's well trained child at home. You remember when we were going through an act? Of course, you remember when you were asleep. And I was like, I got out my hard copies. I like to present hard copies. I pitch as well, and I, you know, spread them out on the table. And he said, No, the TVC. Where is it? And I was like, Well, this is the story. He said, No, the TVC. I know in that moment, I have one of those moments where you think to yourself, there are two ways I could really respond to this. Right? One of them is just to leave. <laughs> Get on a plane and go back to New York and say, clearly, being here doesn't work. But I said to my gentleman, you know, shooting at you, television commercial, it's really expensive and it's really time consuming. And so we generally don't do it until we have been awarded some business. I said, eh, ah, okay. So, which is just to say that there are some clients that don't understand the process of production, right? So, you have to make a decision about how you explain it to them. So, for instance, if I am going to go and, and you also have to make a decision based on the size of the client and what it is that you're going to do. There are some agencies in Nigeria that, no matter who they pitch, they're going to produce a radio jingle. And they're going to produce a radio jingle because they have a radio studio, so it's free for them. We generally don't produce anything for first pitch. But if I'm going to go and pitch Coca-Cola and have a music driven idea, I'm going to use a demo because you know people singing, us singing and happening the things not gonna work. I think from a from the perspective of what you're doing, um, I think that if you have a client that is going to be of a 40, 50, 60 million naira value to you, a 